record on this computer. Okay. All right. So this is Wednesday night Bible study at Consuming Fire Teaching and Deliverance Ministries in Sacramento, California. We welcome you. Uh, this is Open Forum with Pastor Doris Harrell. And last week, we were studying with the Sister Jeanette Binion in the book of Proverbs on the human heart and pride. And we, those of us who are Christians and have done any studying, we know that pride is the thing that caused the devil to fall. Uh, pride is uh, a, a, the ultimate form of selfishness, amen. And it's uh, the, the, the thing that is against God. The, uh, the person that is prideful think that they don't need God and they don't have to do things God's way. And so the question came up, <clears throat> well, actually what happened was the, the acronym P-R-I-D-E, pride, uh, just occurred to me that that is what the um, gay and lesbians use for their thing, um, identity, I guess, pride. And, um, and I thought it was pretty uh, peculiar because pride, the Bible says, goes before a fall. Pride goes before a fall. But then as we were looking at it, we realized that uh, they use that, that uh, pride to say that they are not ashamed of themselves. And the G-A-Y actually literally means good as you. This is what they're trying to say to us. And so that came up last week when we were doing um, pride in the human heart. And uh, this one of the requests from one of the sisters is that we continue in that to dig a little bit more deeply in that. And so that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at why they use the acronym P-R-I-D-E, pride, or that word pride, and G-A-Y, the acronym G-A-Y to mean good as you, uh, to make um, as their theme um, uh, identity. And so go with me to, and, and I know why they use it. Let me tell you, before we go to our Bible, they use it because they know that that lifestyle of man being with man and woman being with woman uh, is morally degradating. We were not created for that. When God created man, he created us in Genesis and he created male and female, created he them. And he told them to go and be fruitful and multiply in the earth. Well, that was the original man and woman, Adam and Eve. And, but when they gave place to the devil, sin came in and sin corrupts. So sin is a corrupter. It's a defiler. Sin is abominable, all sin. Not just, you, you just can't point your finger at the homosexual. You can't just point your finger at the, the murderer. Uh, the people on drugs and alcohol, all sin defiles human beings because we were never created for sin. When God created us originally, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And God is holy. That means without uh, any darkness. There's no darkness in him at all. There's no sin, no, no negative, no, nothing like that. He's holy. And so we were originally created as holy beings. And when sin entered in, it defiled us. And so some sins, uh, of people, most, the Bible tells us that in uh, Ezekiel 16, let's start our study in Ezekiel 16. Because unless sin is pointed out to people, in fact, that's why the law, that's why they brought the law in the Old Testament to show people their sins. Because people, once we start procreating on the earth, we were doing all kinds of things and there was no bars, no, no, no um, 
just doing all kinds of stuff. And so God had to make law to show people you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do this and you can't do that. You can't do that. <laughs> man can't lie with man. Woman can't lie with woman. Uh, you can't have uh, uh, intercourse with animals. See, all that. People was doing everything. You can't, uh, you can't have your, your father's wife. You can't have your sister. They were doing all kinds of things. And so God made the laws in the Old Testament to show you your sin. Now here in Ezekiel 16, even today, many people don't understand their sin. And so right here, Ezekiel 16, 1 and 2, it says, again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying, this is to Ezekiel, son of man, cause Jerusalem or Israel or his people to know their abomination. Now that's a strange statement. Cause Jerusalem to know their abomination. Because when if, if God doesn't point out to us what's wrong and show us our sin, we just go about in life thinking that, uh, okay, this is all right. Uh, this is okay. This is okay. They were doing all kinds of stuff in the Old Testament. But one of the, uh, so some people, some things that you do, you know it's sin. You, just, you know it because you feel guilty. When you do certain things, you feel guilty. Um, and so to, it's, now let me put it this way. I'm 73 and I'm going to say about 50 years ago, maybe 75 years ago. Well, no, no, it was, it was before then. Maybe 50, I'm gonna give 50 years ago. People that uh, were homosexuals was ashamed of their sin. And they stayed what they call in the closet, which meant they did it in darkness, uh, behind closed doors. Uh, they had in San Francisco, they had places where, which were called uh, I, I don't know, a hole in the wall or whatever, where now this is gross. I'm going to tell you something gross where you could go. And because you were, you had this thing on you, which was a drive, basically it was an unclean spirits, uh, unclean spirit that you just had to have it, you know? And that's what all the fornication in the world is, by the way, today, just got to have it, whether it's male and, and male, female, and female, and male, just, just whoremongers and prostitutes and, promiscuous people. I had an unclean spirit when I was in the world. So those are called unclean spirits. You just got to have it. Well, they had this place, these places in San Francisco called Hole in the Walls. And there would be, uh, on one side would be uh, a, a person. I hope no children are listening. Close your children's ears if there's children in the house. On one side of the wall would be a person. And you can't see any, any it was just holes in the wall. The other side of the wall would be people and they would have sex that way. So they didn't see each other. It was a wall between them, it was just holes. And that's where they had sex because they were ashamed. They were ashamed. And then they got so hardened by it uh, that they just decided this, this must, you know, this can't be wrong because it feels right. Remember, you, you can be fooled by a feeling. We all been fooled by a feeling. I know I was fooled by a feeling. Them feelings get you in trouble. And so the thing came, if it feels right, it must be right. So then we had the sexual revolution in the 60s, which some of us know, uh, Sharon knows, Gloria knows. Uh, I don't know who else is on here that knows. Diana knows. Um, well, Diana, you might not be able to us, but you, you know, the, the, the sexual revolution in the 60s, free love, it was a hippie. Now, I, I'm a kind of a hippie person, but I wasn't into all this stuff, everything, but I'm just like, I'm just a free spirit. And so, but then it was, you could have sex with whoever you want. You don't have to have these, these rules, these laws, these sins, you know. Uh, and so that's where they really start coming out of the closet. You know, if, 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 if this is, this, this can't be wrong because it feels right. So people really start coming out of the closet. But just because something feels right doesn't mean it's right. Just because it feels right doesn't mean it's right. And so what happened was they, be, they began to get to make themselves feel better. They began to get as many people as they can like them on their side. 
and started making other people feel guilty by not accepting the way they are. So this is my sin and this is the way God made me and, and you can't tell me this. And, and if you don't accept it, then you're a hater. And so they got as many, many people as they could to get on their side. And so now the voice, and so they took the, the term pride, which, which means I'm just proud of me as you are of you. And then gay, we're good as you. Well, see, nobody ever said, I hope nobody ever said, and if they did say it, they was wrong, that one human being, well, I know people do say that, but, uh, well, let me just put the truth out there. Not one human being is better than another. Not one. God created us all in his image and in his likeness. Amen. The white is not better than the black. The black's not better than the white. The not better than this one, that one, the other. The male's not better than the female. All, that, all of that is lies of the devil. Amen. And so all human striving between the races, between the genders with male and female, a lot of that, a lot of oppressing of the, the female, all of that come from the devil. And so people had to get in groups like women, women's lib. We had to get in groups as women to show people that there was a time not too long ago when women couldn't even vote. It wasn't that long ago that we just got our voting rights. Amen. Wasn't that long ago that the black, black people just got their voting rights. It's a shame, but all that's from the devil. So, so we have to understand one thing. We are all created by God. And none of us is better than the other. But sin is the defiler. Sin is what is the abomination. And if you sin, then you become an abomination. Sin is a defiler. And if you let sin defile you, you've been defiled. Sin is a corrupter. And so, but people don't want to let go of their sin because it feels good. It all bottom line down to feel good. And so they got as many people as they could and then, and then pride, you know. And so uh, the more in the, in the world, the system of the world, as many, I'm not talking about Christians now because there ain't but one, well, we know there ain't but one way and it's straight and narrow. But as many voices that you can get, the, the one that gets the laws changed and all this and that and the other are the ones with the loudest voice with the most people. And so, uh, that's where that comes from. Pride. We are proud of us. We don't care what you say. But the, the real major issue that I, well, I have two major issues with. It. They don't understand that sin will, is de, that sin is defining them uh, and it's going to send them to hell. They don't understand that. And oh, so that's a major issue for me as a, as a minister. Any sin. You know, there's some sins that send you, some sins, you know, won't, but some sins that send you to hell and fornication is one of them. Now, fornication is any sexual sin. It don't matter what, whether it be male or female, man and man, woman and woman, that is a sin that will keep you from going to heaven. So I have an issue with that. The other issue I have with the movement is they try to force it on people. Don't force that on me. You know, if that's what you want to do with your life, that's your business, but don't force it on me and call me a hater. I'm not a hater. I absolutely love you. But sin is an abomination. Whether it's uh, the sin of pride, the sin of uh, fornication, the sin of addictions of sin of all kind of sin we got christians that sin all with a, a, a hateful heart bitterness envy jealousy all that sin every bit of it is detestable every bit of it every single bit of it and so they have because they know now i'm telling you now the truth because they know it's wrong they know it's wrong they have to get as many voices as they can together and uh, that acronym, PRIDE. So that's what that is. But that's the sin, y'all, that was pointed out to us last week that caused Satan to fall from heaven. 
pride. And so let's look at that in Isaiah 14. Let me write these scriptures down. We started with Ezekiel 16. It says, show, cause Jerusalem to know there by many people just going around don't even know. You know, but I'm gonna tell you, nothing wrong with people, it's sin. God loves people, but it's sin. We can love the sinner, but hate the sin. That's what we have to understand. Love the sinner. Hate the sin. And that's what they need to know. We love you. Whatever sin you got. But I hate your sin because it defiles you. Amen. So we got Ezekiel 16. We're doing Isaiah 14. So Isaiah 14, we're going to look at how Satan fell. And right here in Isaiah 14, 12 through 12 to 15. Could someone uh, volunteer to read that, please? 12 to 15, 12 to 15. I will pass. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Amen. That's pride. See, that's the sin that was found in well, Lucifer at the time, this high-ranking angel, Lucifer, he was a high-ranking cherubim. He was a worshiping cherubim. He was very, very beautiful, very close to God. He uh, reflected the image of God. All he could do was reflect the image of God. But because he was close to God, and God had highly exalted him by being closer to him, angels all over heaven, but there are some that just worship worship he was a worshiping angel they worshiped all the time and uh but because he was that and the close the closer you get to god the more you reflect his glory he began to think it was him that he could be like god i will so he wanted to be like god and he said i will set my let's see what he said here so this is pride it was him so pride is always selfish it's all about me i pride doesn't humble itself under the mighty hand of God. Pride sees itself as equal to God or better than this or whatever. But okay, here it says, uh, verse 12. So now we see how Lucifer, which was the high arch, uh, angel that became uh, um, Satan. How art thou fallen from where? From heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did as weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I, anytime it's I, 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 you tell my pride, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I'm better than them. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. You tell me I'm going to be like God. I'm going to have people worshiping me like God, what he's saying. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. But what happened in verse 15? They threw him out of there right away, threw him right out of heaven. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They threw him out of heaven. So pride, in that sense, is not a good thing. And we'll look at another form of pride at the end of this. I don't want to get thrown off. In that sense, it's not a good thing. And see, that's the lie. Go to Genesis 3. That's a lie. So he was, he did get, uh, well, before we go to Genesis 3, let's go to Revelations. I believe it's 20. Let me write this down. They're going to be coming to me fast. So I'm going to be writing them down. Go to Revelations um, 12, I believe it is. And let's see how he got th through out of heaven. 
because he said he gonna be like God. Pride, now, the Bible says that pride goes before a fall. So uh, to, to pick a, the, the P-R-I-D-E as your theme uh, for your uh, movement, it's not, I don't think it's a wise thing, but I know what they're saying. They're saying we're proud of who we are. But, you know, they got it all wrong. The sin is what corrupts them. So pro, uh, let's see, Revelation 12. We want to see here. Re Revelation 12, verse 7. Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was war where? In heaven. See, we just talked about Lucifer being in heaven, talking that smack to God. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now drop down to verse 12. Therefore, rejoice ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. So he got cast out of heaven. There was war. They, he fought to stay there. He actually fought to stay in heaven. He was called the dragon. Remember, there's two, two modus operandi of the devil. He's a deceiver and a persecutor. He's either going to come to you real slick as a, as a serpent and, and try to deceive you that way. The Bible says he deceived the whole world like the homosexuals are deceived, just like a whole lot of us was deceived. Or if he can't get you that way, he's going to persecute you and afflict you. And that's called the dragon. So once he tried to, and the first person that Satan, the first person that Lucifer deceived was his own self. Nothing worse than see, deceiving your own self. He deceived his own self into thinking he's going to be like the most high. Now, how deceptive is that? you going to be like the most high. You don't even have your own light. The only light you have is what you reflect off of God. <laughs> the Bible says he comes he comes reflect down here masquerading as an angel of light, still deceiving people. And so he got cast out of heaven. So there was war. He didn't just, bam, like that. He fought, he fought to stay there. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm going to be like the most high. Uh -uh. But him and his angels, that's in, in Isaiah where it says he deceived the nations. He talked about the nations of angels. He took a one third of the angels with him. He deceived them into thinking he's this, that, and the other. So it's no wonder that anybody's deceived. That it, deception is a very powerful thing. It's a per, persuasive thing. And so, uh, and we all were deceived by saying that sometime or another. And a lot of people are still deceived by it. Most deceived person in the world and think there is no devil. And so he did get cast out. He fought and they didn't, it means prevail, not, not means they did not win. They was cast out, but they were cast out where? Down here with us, Lord have mercy. And so he landed in the garden. So let's go now. Let's go to Genesis three. He, he landed down there. The first man and woman was there, created in the image and the likeness of God, holy, amen, just like God. So he landed there and started lying or deceiving. He, he went. He came specifically to deceive the human being, and uh, he ended up deceiving the woman. There's a lot it doesn't tell us. He might have tried to deceive the man and couldn't. Uh, maybe the man didn't talk to him. The woman stopped and had a conversation with him. And I'm going to tell you, if you have a conversation with people, if you don't are not filled with the Holy Spirit and, and know this word and, 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 and verse in this, you can be deceived. It's easy to be deceived if you don't know God. Amen. And so here in Genesis 3, it says, now the serpent, now the serpent, remember just in, in Revelation 12, we saw that the, the devil was called the dragon, that old serpent. That old serpent. So those are two modus operandi. So here he's operating in the uh, the deceptive mode. He's he didn't come to them as a dragon. Yeah. 
He didn't come to them. He came to them uh, as to, a, to Eve. Has not God said? See, he's masquerading as an angel of light here. Amen. And so, so here uh, in Genesis 3, 1, it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yeah, as God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the, free, of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the trees, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. See, God had already given them their instructions. God had already given them their instructions, just like he gives us our instructions in this book. But the serpent came and said, you don't have to believe that. You're not going to really die. I don't care what God said. You're not going to die. Then he said in verse five, for God does know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, like it was some good thing for them to know evil. And then the, the Bible says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant uh, to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. And their eyes were open to evil. We were never, ever, ever supposed to know evil. We were always supposed to only enjoy good and be holy, just like God. But sin, when, when Satan came down to the garden and introduced sin to Adam and Eve, it defiled them. And it says, verse 7, and the eyes of them both were open and they knew they were naked. Before they were naked and it was no problem because they were holy. Now that sin entered, the, their, their nakedness became evil. They saw their corruption. And they sewed thick leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, what is that hiding? That hiding is, can somebody tell me why they were hiding? Just raise your hand up if you want to know, if you have an idea of why, why. Raise your hand. Okay, Sister Jeanette, why? Because yourself. they were made aware of the sin. Because they, they felt, they felt guilty. They felt guilty. So this is a point. They felt guilty because they knew they had sin, just like she said. They knew that because sin makes you feel guilty. This is why 50 years ago, the homosexual, it was a, it was a sin. It was a, they were ashamed of it. They felt guilty and they hid. They were in the closet. They, was in the, they knew it was wrong. They knew it was wrong. But I'm, I'm going to show you a scripture that what happened to them and then they want to come out of the closet. You know, they, they didn't care anymore. We come in, oh, we're good as you. You know, we don't need God to tell us what's good. And isn't that what Satan just said right there? It says that, uh, verse five, for God does know that in the day you eat there, the, your eyes shall be open and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. You know what he was saying? You don't need God to tell you what's good and evil. You can know that by yourself. That's what he was saying. It's the same, it's nothing new under the sun. This is the same sin. And so the Bible says, uh, she, when she saw or was deceived or believed the devil, that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eye, eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She, they thought they had become, were really gonna get something. We're what, gonna become wise. They took it and ate of it. And I'm gonna show you what happened to them. And so uh, verse uh, nine, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where are you? Why are you hiding? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And then the conversation goes on and, and they talked about the sin and everything. And, uh, but the point is here comes guilt and fear. There was no shame before. 
There was no shame until the sin came because sin makes you feel ashamed when you first do it. But you can become hardened to sin. You keep doing it, keep doing it. You get enough people around you that's doing it and get somebody in the corner, you know, and, and say, now, now we've been doing this and y'all trying to put us down and y'all just haters. And so there becomes their pride. We have pride in our, basically pride in their sin. I'm telling you, it's not pride in their self because they are as good as anybody else, but pride in their sin. And so that, that's the origin of that. So now let's go over to, so now pride goes before fall. We saw where Satan had pride and he fell. Now go to Proverbs 16 and 18, and then I'm gonna open it up for comments in just a second. Proverbs 16 and 18, and somebody else volunteer to read that. Proverbs 16 and 18. Proverbs 16, verse 18. I'll read it, Pastor. Okay. Proverbs 16. And I'm going to say 18 and 19. I never saw that together until just now. So we're going to. Okay. Pride goes okay. before destruction, a haunty spirit before a fall. Yes. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. Right. So pride goes before a fall. When you, when you start thinking that you know better than God, get ready to fall, get ready to fall. That's called pride. It goes before a fall. That when, when you start thinking we don't have to do what God says, it's, it's God's will and it's God's way. If God says, this sin is an abomination, don't do this, don't do that, don't do it. Let's look at some sin. Let's go to Leviticus. Let's go to Leviticus. I, did, I gotta Google it. I'm not quite sure where it's at, but I wanna show you some of these sins in Leviticus. God said, this, these are abominations. So once ha what happened was once people um, uh, started uh, procreating in the earth, uh, uh, and you know, Adam and Eve was the first pure people, but after that, everybody was sin. It got, sin got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And uh, they got doing all kind of sin, all kind of sin. And then God had to, to make laws for them. You can't do that. You can't lie with your sister. You can't have your, your, your father's wife. You and your sister can't be having sex. Man and man can't lay together. Woman and woman can't lay together. You can't have sex with your animals. He had to do laws because our flesh, because we had evil spirits by then. Uh, let's you know, not lie with man. I, uh, with mankind. So you have to see this. Go with me to Leviticus 20, probably. We'll start there anyway. So there, had, so there had to be some law to show people. You have to show people where they're wrong. In our hearts, you know, the heart of deceitful above many things. To us, if it feels right, it's right. If, if your mind hasn't been renewed by the word of God, or if we think it's right and can get enough people to, to agree with us, it's right and you don't care what the Bible says and what you say. You know, that's called pride. And it does what? Sister uh, uh, Diane just read it. It goes before a fall. That's why uh, the, the, the wonderful book that we just read, Sister Jeanette just taught us in Proverbs, uh, was about pride. For two weeks, we taught it. It was a, a great lesson. And so it spilled over into tonight. Amen. Because we need to understand some things. So uh, Leviticus tw uh, 20 here. Let's see how much of this I can get. Um, I just want to show you a few things. 20, uh, let's see here, let's, uh, okay, well, let's just start at uh, seven. Now, basically, God is showing people, you can't do these things that y'all doing. He had to show them their sin. Remember in Ezekiel 16, one, it says, cause Jerusalem to know their abomination. It's not you, there's nothing wrong with you, it's the sin. It's the sin. God loves you. He died for you. It's the, he died to take away that sin. That's what they don't understand. So here in uh, Leviticus 27, sanctify yourselves 
and be ye holy for I the Lord God uh, am you, the Lord God. He said, I'm holy, I create you be holy and you shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctifies you and everyone that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father and his mother and his blood shall be upon him. Look at that, back then, uh, uh, when a person cursed their father and mother, it was a death sentence. Even today, God tells us that if you don't honor your father and your mother, it's not gonna, you're not going to have a, uh, it's not going to be well with you. And look here, verse 10. And the man that committed adultery with another man's wife, even he that committed adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall be surely be put to death. See, back then, God was showing you these things are abominations. The adulterers, he clearly shows you what adultery is, a man having sex with another man's wife. He said the adulterer and the adulteress, the man and the woman, shall be put to death. Now, remember in the New Testament, those old hypocritical Pharisees, they caught a woman in adultery, but they brought the woman, they didn't bring the man. They just brought the woman and threw it before Jesus. And Jesus told them a thing or two, that's another story. Verse 11. And the man that lies with his father's wife, look at there. He said, you can't do that. Has uncovered his father's nakedness. That's his, his wife. You ain't supposed to be up in there with his wife. Don't you know that's an abomination? Both of them shall surely be put to what? Death. Look at verse 12. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, they were doing all kinds of stuff. Both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Confusion. Now, and what, what do they mean by that? I'm going to tell you. That's why God says flee fornication. As long as you don't have intercourse with a person, you're all right. But once you connect with them sexually, you get confused. The thing that you knew before, you can't think right anymore. Your emotions are all messed up. That's why he said flee fornication. Verse 13. If a man also lie with mankind as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, look at the sins they was doing. It is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire. Both he and they, they put them to death in the fire, that there be no wickedness among you. Look at this one. And if a man lie with a beast, have sex with animals, he shall surely be put to death and he shall uh, slay the beast. They have to kill the beast because now the beast is confused. They don't know what. In verse 16, and if a woman approach unto a beast and lie down before him, thou shalt kill the woman and the beast. They shall surely be put to death. Verse 17, and if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter and see her nakedness and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing. And they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. You're not supposed to be looking at your sister's nakedness. And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness or her menstruation, in other words, and shall uncover her nakedness, he has discovered her fountain and she has uncovered the fountain of her blood and both of them shall be cut off. He said, that's filthy. Give her a chance to recuperate. Oh, filthy rascal, you can't even wait for four, five days for this. Oh, Lord. <laughs> so it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And so what God had to do was what had happened when sin entered. Uh, <laughs> on and on. And all these things still happen today. But you can't tell people about it. Oh, and, and it talks about the, the, the pedophiles and stuff, you know. And so they fighting to get their rights to have sex with kids. Do y'all know that? Do y'all know that? That the pedophiles yeah. are fighting, yeah. fighting for their rights to have sex with your children. My yeah. God. Woo! And all of this comes from evil spirits. It came from Lucifer. Uh, pride goes before fall. Amen. So pride is an awful sin. I mean, we might, Sister uh, Jeanette, let me ask you something. Could you could you unmute yourself and un, un, un video tape yourself? Yes, ma'am. Do you feel like when, when it come back around, can we, I, I, let me see your face. Let them see your face. Okay. 
when, um, when you come back around, because we're going to be open for him for two weeks. Yes. But when you come back around, can we do Pride again? Certainly. I think it's that important. I think it's that important because that is the greatest sin right there. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Just Satan said, you don't have to do what God says. Let's repeat it. Okay. So two weeks from now, okay, praise God. Okay. I just wanted to get the teachers instructed. Two weeks from now, yes, we're going to go back on. It's that important. So you understand what's happening. Yes, they're as good as us. It's the sin. The sin of pride. So they've taken that no, uh, nom nominer, you know, it's, it's the name, as their theme for, for their movement. But it's a bad one. <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's so bad because pride goes before fall. Pride came from Satan. It was found in Satan. Amen. Now, I'm going to take you to one another scripture. Um, so I hope y'all are writing these scriptures down. Look back at how, how wicked men came. Um, let's see. Not a novice. Okay. Now, this is why we don't have young Christians. God said don't have young Christians that don't, don't go through the process at, uh, uh, as ministers. Not a novice. I'll show you what happens to them. A novice is a young Christian that has not matured. Let's go to 1 Timothy 3 through 6. You got a lot of young Christians that are not matured. They haven't gone through the process that I talked about on Sunday. They, they, they don't want to submit under apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher. They want to do it their own way. And the Bible says they fall into, uh, I'll, I'll show you what it says. I don't want to misquote. So 1 Timothy 3, I'm going to ask somebody to read it. Three and uh, let's see here. One through seven. First, who, who would like to read that? First Timothy three, one through seven. These are people that want to be a pastor. So that's going to be Sister Shante. These are people that want, these are the qualifications for uh, someone that wants to be a bishop or a pastor. Now, when it says, of, of one wife it could be also a wife of one husband so that's another story another uh message also but let's we're going to look at this in the context of we're studying pride okay sister shantae is going to read it first timothy 3 1 through 7 and this is in this context a young christian that has not submitted himself under themselves under the fivefold ministry apostle prophet pastor evangelist and teacher so that we can bring you to your destiny God said, you don't qualify to be a minister, but we have many, many young pe people that want, don't want to go through that. They know they got a calling, and all of us have a calling, and they want to jump out there, and then something could happen to them, and uh, she's going to read. Okay. Amen. First Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Thank you, Jesus. This is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospital, I'm sorry, hospitable, able to teach. Verse three, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous. Verse four, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Verse six, not a no novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Verse seven, Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Amen. Thank you. These are qualifications for a bishop or a pastor. A lot of folks, <laughs> you could count some of them off right here. In verse two, a bishop must then be blameless. You just cut some off right there. See that? <laughs> but uh, it goes on and on and on. First of all, I tell you, this is a good 
thing to desire. It's a good thing, but there's qualifications with it. Uh, it you must be blameless. You could only have one wife, or if you're going to be a woman, pastor, one husband. You got to be sober. This, sober means sound mind. You got to be vigilant. That means right on it, you know, watching and praying. Uh, 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 good behavior, not out there acting a fool and you want to be a pastor. Given to hospitality, that means you're kind to people. Apt to teach, you got to be able to teach. Uh, some people, don't, they don't want to submit to, to mature. How can a child teach a child? Not given to wine, not supposed to be a drinker. No striking, they're supposed to be abusing people. Not really a filthy look, you're not getting in it for the money. But patient, not a brawler, which means quarrelsome and debating and all that. Not covetous, competing, competing. Yeah, I want a bigger child, I want this, I want what they got, all that. One that rules well his own house, having his children and uh, having raised your own children. You know, people want to be a pastor and their children are, are, are just crazy, you know. If, so it tells you right here in verse five, if you don't know how to rule your own house, take care of the house of God. So the Bible says, then he says, not a novice. Now, a novice is a new convert or a young Christian. This is very key when it comes to pride. Not a novice. People come in to the kingdom of God. Everybody that comes in has a call. God, remember Sunday's lesson, many are called, but few chosen. Everyone has a call. Many are called, but few chosen. And you know it. Many times you know it. I knew that I was called to be a teacher. Even when, when God did, I knew it at a young age. At Calvary, when you um, uh, go, uh, go through your new membership classes, they want to put you to, to work in the ministry because they know that's good so that you can be doing something. They don't want you to have idle hands. And so one of the things you have to go into the office after you finish your new membership classes, which is about seven new membership classes. And uh, you have to go in the office and have an interview. And they say, okay, what do you feel like you're called to do? And I said, what I know, I knew in my heart, I'm a young Christian, but I knew I was called to teach. I didn't know how, I just knew all this was put in me. And I'm like, this can't possibly just be for me. You know, and so I remember the pastor, my great friend, Pastor Turner, beautiful man. He he gave me a scripture in Romans, and and it says, uh, it said, uh, a man not ought to think of himself more highly than he ought to. And I'm gonna tell you, I felt offended. I'm like, why you give me that? Why you give me that? <laughs> but he gave it to me because uh, I don't know why he gave it to me, but that's what he gave me. And he probably gets a lot of people in the office saying they call to be a teacher, call to be a teacher. So he started me out in the youth ministry. And I worked in the youth ministry. That didn't work out too good. <laughs> and so one day in um, at seven o'clock service, that's when we had our miracle service, 7 p.m. at night. The, the guy that had started New Beginnings, he, has, he just recently started New Beginnings. He couldn't, uh, drug and alcoholic, he was a recovering alcoholic and he wanted to start it in the church and he talked to Pat and, and uh, uh, Pat just said, okay, so he started it. And so he was recruiting for people to come and work with him and um, nobody wanted to. Nobody wanted to work with drugs, drug addicts and alcohol. Nobody wanted that. They, they wanted to have the glorious ministry, the flag ministry, the, the <laughs> whatever, whatever. And I went and joined with him because my parents was alcohol. And uh, I love them. I say they was alcoholic, but they was my alcoholic, okay? And so I went to work with him. Uh, and uh, one, one long before he left, I guess I, I worked with him about a month. And then he left and I'm, I'm relatively new, but by then I'd grown a little bit older. And uh, that's where I developed that teaching ministry, that teaching gift to me in New Beginnings. I worked there for 13 years and developed this gift uh, that was in me. But uh, to be a pastor or to, like I am now, I had to be trained. I went to 13 years in the New Beginnings ministry training for this. I didn't know I was training for this. I had no idea I was gonna be sitting in this chair in this position. Uh, so it says here, not a novice. So uh, like I said, everyone has a calling, but you have to be under tutors and governors 
until the time appointed of the Father, which means you got to go through training, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. So many years I trained, and, uh, and I, I went from there to another church and worked with them for four to six years, I forgot now. And so now I hear this. So you can't be a novice, just come in now, I want to teach, me, but you're a young Christian, you have to mature. Less, now look what it says, let's be lifted up with pride. He fall into the same condemnation of the devil. A deaconess, could you, is that, does that read different in Amplified? What's that verse uh, seven? Six. Oh, six. Uh, yeah. yeah, it reads a little bit different. It reads, okay. he must not be a new convert or he may develop a develop and be clouded and stupid state of mind as the result of pride, be blinded by conceit and fall into condemnation that the devil once did. Amen. So what made the devil fall? Pride. And so uh, a, a young new Christian, they want to jump out there and do this and that, and they're, they're headed for a fall because they're not mature, they're not trained. Then this last qualification, this is another one. Moreover, now we kind of get a little bit off on this, but I have to bring it out which, because we're there. He must have a good report of them, which are out without, that means outside. In, in their jobs and stuff, unless he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So here's a person that, that can't keep a job, can't keep a job. And every job they get on, they have trouble with the, the people on the job or the, uh, uh, the, the authority in the job, they can't keep a job. They stealing from the job, they, they coming in late, they uh, leaving early, they not doing their job. That's what this means. You must have a good report of them that are who you work with in the world. He that's faithful in the least will be faithful in the much. So if you haven't shown in the world that you're a good employee, or you can come to work on time, you can give them a good uh, eight hours and stuff. In the world, you go uh, think you qualify to be a pastor <laughs> because the same thing you were doing then is say. And so now they got these young Christians these days that don't won't even work. They'd rather beg you out your money than to work. They will not take a, uh, a $15 an hour job, will not, but they will beg you for your $15 an hour job money. But they wanna be a pastor, a pastor. <laughs> That's straight out pride. So anyway, we go. Oh, but this is a good one to read y'all. Uh, uh, 1 Timothy 3, one through seven. So he that's faithful in the least will be faithful in the much. I worked faithfully 42 years in the world. That's what it means by those that are without, those outside of the church. That's your secular job. 42 long years, faithful, never called in, uh, no call, no show. A no call, no show is where you just ain't going today. I just ain't gonna go to work today. I know people that uh, they don't show up for work and uh, they don't call, they don't show. And uh, when I retired after 42 years, y'all, let me tell y'all, this is funny, but this is how it was. I said, I never called in once, uh, no call, no show. So what I did, I set my alarm and uh, when it rang, I said, I ain't going. Now I'm retired now. <laughs> I said, I ain't going to work. I just, I just wanted to see how it feel. But I had a good report outside. But you got these people, these young Christians that full of pride, and they don't want to submit under the apostle, prophet, pastor, better teacher. Uh, they'll never reach their full destiny. I mean, they can start a ministry, but it's going to be messed up. It's going to be messed up. You know, they're going to be in it for the wrong things. All that stuff with a filthy look. They're going to be brawlers. I mean, it's just messed up, you know. So, but anyway, uh, Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We just bought all the time. Okay, so now I said I was going to open it up. So let me open it up for a few minutes anyway. It that went on and on, but it's, it's really so good. <laughs> Praise God. I'm, I'm glad we went over that. So we can, um, we'll see what happens next week. But uh, in two weeks from now, we're going to go back over in our book of Proverbs on 
the human heart and pride because it is that important. So the main thing was that we understood why the gay people use pride as their acronym or whatever it is uh, for their movement because they're, they, they, they oh, oh, I know I have to give you that scripture. They want people to say that uh, we're proud of our lifestyle, you know, and that uh, we're as, as good as you, G-A-Y, good as you, that's what it means. But I want you to go to Hebrews 3 and 13 to see uh, when they came out of the closet, what happened to them. It's so, so sad. This is what happened. And so anyone that uh, gets convicted of their sins, it's a wonderful thing to be convicted of this. And you feel guilty about you know, the acts that you do in sin, that's good. That's called conviction. But sin can harden your heart to where you actually think you're right. So, because sin is something else. Sin is deceitful. Hebrews 3.13, can I get someone to read that last scripture? Hebrews 3 and 13. So a volunteer to read our last scripture, please. I can't get a volunteer. Oh. <laughs> Who is that? Somebody. It was somebody else. 13 does me. Okay. 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 Hebrews 3.13. Okay. Uh, Hebrews 3.13. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Least any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Amen. And that's lest. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a King James. Well, yes, this is King left. James. I was reading it out of King James tonight. So it's less, not least. It's less. It means oh, unless. Oh, where, where? Let me see. Well, you see it called it another. Oh, least. L E S T. It's is less. less. Oh, okay. Because it's kind of like unless. Oh, That's the okay. way of saying it. Amen. Okay. So, but. I'll read it out to Amplified too. It's good. Oh, Let's see. Okay. Okay, Deaconess will read out the Amplify. But this is a message right here, Sister Diana. Remember you said, let's let's go over that. Let's go over that on which it's this scripture right here. Go ahead, Deaconess. But instead, warn, admonish, urge, and encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin, by the fraudulence of the, the stratagem, the trickery which the, which the delusive glamour of his sin may play on him. That's it. That is it right there. The sin, you, you know, you, you want to do it because it feels right. Even if it don't feel right, you know, you just want to have you shame. You're really shame of it. Really, they are. Deal about it, but still you want to do it. So let me get as many people on my bandwagon, get a bunch of, well, let's do some parades and stuff. Pride, we pride. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you. It's the sin. It's the sin. It has, it has defiled you. It is corrupting you. God loves you. He died for you. He loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And I don't care what the name of it is. Go back to Leviticus. There's all kinds of sin. Sin defiles human beings. So yes, you are good as everybody else, but the sin is defiling you. And that's the culprit. And it says here, I want Deaconess to read that one more time. I'm going to read it out of King James, but and, and I want Deaconess to read it one more time because that's the point. But exhort one another daily. Exhort means to warn. While it's called today, which means, I mean, we may be running out of time. Lest any of you, any of you, anybody can fall, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. See, you, if you, you, you can get anybody to get on your bandwagon. Oh, my God. So, Deaconess, please read that one more time, and then we're going to shut it down with song. Amen. But instead, warn, admonish, urge, and encourage one another every day, as long as it is called today, 
that none of you may be hardened into settled rebellion by the deceitfulness of sin, by the fraudulence, the strategies, the trickery, which the, dis, the dis, delusive glamour of his sin may play on him. My God, my God. That's pride all day. Pride goes before a fall. So we thank, Lord, we thank you for this lesson tonight. We just thank you and praise you that our eyes were opened and that we would have more compassion on people that have let sin harden their heart, Lord God. They are deceived. Sin is deceitful. It was deceitful from the beginning when, when, the, uh, when uh, the serpent put it on Eve in the garden. It was deceitful, deceitful from the beginning. But thank you for opening our eyes so that we could have compassion on people, that we could love the sinner but hate the sin, no matter what it's called, the alcoholic, the drug addict. My God, the rapist, the murderers, even the pedophiles, Lord God. The homosexuals, Lord, we love them because you love them. And we're all created in your image and your likeness. But we hate the sin that is defiling them and corrupting them. We hate it, Lord. Oh, God, we ask you to help them right now in Jesus' name and bring some of them to their senses. Lord, through this video, we're asking you to reach out and touch their hearts and cause them to grieve uh, for their sin and to repent. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to, I'm going to stop the uh, recording and we'll go out on a song. <laughs>